Uh, well, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for their invitation and their hospitality during my stay here. It's a, it's a wonderful place to be here and to work. So the goal uh, for today, I would like to describe an explicit construction of the local Langes correspondence in the following setting. We're going to take discrete parameters, which are uh, whose source is the V group rather than the V delin group, and G is going to be a connected reductive group defined over F non-Archimedean and split over a tame extension, and there will be a restriction on P. The residual characteristic P will not be allowed to divide the order of the vial group. So this will be this will be the goal. Now this will break into two pieces. First, there will be the regular situation, and many of you may have seen me speak on that. Um, and the next one will be the singular case. The remaining parameters that are not regular. Um, but the ideas here, they're based on the ideas in the regular case and carry them further, so I'll, I'll spend some time reviewing the regular case before moving on to the singular case. Uh, now, conjecturally, the L packet corresponding to such a parameter consists entirely of supercuspidal representations. Um, but conversely, that does not mean that every supercuspidal representation will occur in such an L packet. There will be supercuspidal representations that occur in packets mixed with discrete series. The parameters for those conjecturally would be non trivial on the SO2 copy, and I'll have nothing to say about those. So, and the construction of this correspondence rests on some results in representation theory which are all ultimately motivated by what happens for real groups. So I'll start as a motivation by a quick review of what happens with real groups. So G over R, connected reductive, the theory is due to Harish Chandra, so this group has discrete series representations if and only if there exists an elliptic maximal torus And if it exists, it is actually unique up to conjugation by the R points of G. And then in that situation, Harish Chandra says the following, pi irreducible discrete series, these are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the following kind of data. It's a tuple of a B and a theta up to the action of the real vial group where B here is a Borel subgroup of G defined over the complex numbers containing this elliptic maximal torus S that we have fixed now, and theta is a character on this real torus with the property that its differential is dominant for this Borel subgroup, and all of this is taken up to the action of the vial group. There is a very important counterpart to this classification theorem, namely the, the Harish Chandra's theorem for the character of a discrete series representation. So if we take a regular element in that particular torus, then Harish Chandra gives a formula for the character function of this representation pi corresponding to a pair theta b, evaluated to this particular element s, and the formula has, it's an explicit formula that looks like this. There is a minus sign taken to half the dimension of the symmetric space, and then there is a sum over the vial group, and then in the numerator, we have this character theta, and then the denominator is the usual vial denominator, where we take the product over the positive roots. Positivity is taken with respect to B, which is 
the Borel here, and then we have the vial denominator, one minus the root inverse evaluated at the element. Oh, I'm mixing S's and gammas. I'm sorry about this, gamma and S are the same thing. So this is the formula, and this formula, not only does this give a formula for the character of the representation, but in fact it uniquely characterizes the representation. There is precisely one representation having this formula. Um, so now in most cases, in most cases this differential is going to be regular. It's not going to lie on any wall of, of a vial chamber. And then if we restrict to d theta regular, what we're going to obtain is the following. Well, on this side, we can call these regular discrete series. And on this side, we can drop the B, because the B now will be determined by this d theta. But on the other hand, we could introduce S, which was fixed now, into the notation. So there will be pairs of S and theta. <laughs> And because S was unique up to G of R conjugacy, we're going to be taking now everything up to G of R conjugacy. And now here, S in G elliptic maximal torus, theta character, such that D theta regular. Okay, so this is the picture over the real numbers. And I would like to take this picture as a motivation in the discussion of Piatti groups, would like to obtain a similar kind of parametrization of representations as well as character formula. Okay, so now we're going to move to Piatti groups and discuss regular supercuspidal representations. So F here is non-Archimedean, local field, G over F connected, reductive, split, over a tame extension. So what is known about this situation? There is a construction of supercuspidal representations due to Ju Kang Yu. And the input of this construction is a certain kind of datum. It starts with a tower of connected reductive subgroups, there is a sequence of characters and there is even a representation here. So let me describe this, uh, some of these properties. So G i in G is what is called a tame twisted levy. So this is a connected reductive subgroup which is not a levy subgroup of the group G but when you base change to some field extension it becomes um, a Levy subgroup, so that's what twisted means, and tame means that the base change should be with respect to a tame extension. And then phi i is a character, and then pi minus one is a depth zero supercuspidal representation of the smallest of these groups. Now let me remind you just briefly about depth, so any pi supercuspidal there is associated by work of Moy and Prasad a non-negative rational number which is its depth and Moy and Prasad show that if the depth of pi is zero then pi is obtained in a fairly explicit fashion as a compact induction from a certain maximal compact open subgroup. So K inside of GS is maximal compact mod center. And Bruhatit's theory tells us that these things arise as normalizers of maximal parahoric subgroups and so this representation rho here is of the following kind. Rho is an irreducible representation of the quotient of k by p plus, which is the pro-unipotent radical. 
All right, so it's an irreducible representation of this group, and if we restrict it to the quotient of the parahoric by its pronipotent radical, well, this now is a finite group of Lie type. And so there is a lot of structure in the representation theory of finite groups of Lie type. This has to contain a cuspidal irreducible representation. Okay, so this is, this is the moi prasad theory in depth zero, and then use construction tells us how to go beyond depth zero and how to construct representations of positive depth. So if we know how to construct representations of depth zero, then using this tower construction, we'll obtain representations of positive depth. So what is known about use construction, so this was 2001, here are some results that will be important for us regarding use construction. So in 2007, Julie Kim shows that this construction is surjective when the characteristic of F is zero and when the residual characteristic is very big. And this was recently improved, I think, I don't know, I think we should say just 2018. This, one, this, this was improved by Finson, who showed that surjectivity already holds, first of all, characteristic zero is not important. It holds in zero or positive characteristic. But secondly, there is a sharp bound on P. P does not divide the order of the vowel group. Already then, every supercuspidal representation is obtained from use construction. On the other hand, in 2008, this is for general group, for any group for which use construction works. So not 100% general, but split over the same extension. And um, Hakim and Murnahan have studied the fibers. So they define a certain equivalence relation on these data and show that the fibers are precisely the equivalence classes. So in some sense, using all of these results, we have a classification of the supercuspidal representations in by as equivalence relations, equivalence classes of this such data. But we would like to have something much simpler. We would like to have something that looks like this. So this is the first result that I want to present. Uh, I'm, it's not going to hold for all representations. It's going to hold for regular representations. Let me tell you what this means. So pi is regular if and only if. Now, well, it, first of all, it comes from use construction, which by Finson's result is automatic when p does not divide the order of the vowel group. But we could, of course, make this definition without assuming that p does not divide the order of the vowel group. And pi minus one, which is part of this datum here, well, it, this is related to rho by moi prasad theory. And rho contains a cuspidal representation. I want to say that rho contains a regular delin lustig character. Namely, delin lustig theory produces virtual representations of finite groups of Lie type. These decompose into irreducible pieces, and any rep cuspidal representation can be found in such pieces. But in fact, most cuspidal rep most delin lustig characters are themselves irreducible representations. And most cuspidal representations are such irreducible regular delin lustig characters. And this is my restriction on pi. And so then here is the theorem. We have a bijection, basically given by use construction. But now the data, so on this side, we have regular supercuspidal representations. Whereas on this side, the data is exactly as in the real case. G of F conjugacy classes of pairs where S is elliptic tame maximal torus and theta is a regular character. I don't want to spend time explaining exactly what regular means, but it's a, it's a simple construction having to do with the vowel group and roots. So let me leave it at that. Uh, this works when P 
is not a bad prime, which is a technical term introduced by Springer and Steinberg, and any prime bigger than seven is not bad. So uh, there is a table for what, what bad primes are for every root system. And this condition here is already stronger than not being a bad prime. So you can, even though this theorem holds under the slightly weaker condition, you're welcome to assume the stronger condition over there. Okay, so the next thing I want to discuss is a, an analog of Harish Chandra's character formula. Yes. Yes, the construction is via compact open induction. Okay, so the character formula All right, so there is work of Adler, Debacker, and Spice. That writes down a character formula for any supercuspidal representation coming from use construction. What I want to present here is just a reinterpretation of, of their work that uh, gives a particular formulas for the roots of unity, the interesting roots of unity that occur in this formula. So we're going to need the following notation. We're going to take the absolute root system of this torus S, and there, the Galois group of our local field is going to act on this root system. So when we, t when we take a root alpha, we're going to have certain subgroups of the Galois groups, namely the stabilizer of alpha, or a possibly slightly bigger group, the stabilizer of the set plus minus alpha. And correspondingly, we're going to have the fixed fields. And this is going to be an extension of degree one or two. And if the degree is two, we call alpha symmetric. If the degree is one, we call alpha asymmetric. So this was terminology introduced by Langens and Schellstadt. And what we're now going, what we'll be able to do is we can define the following arithmetic invariants for any symmetric root, an element in F alpha cross and a character of F alpha cross with obvious Galois invariance properties. Namely, A minus alpha is minus A alpha, A sigma alpha is sigma A alpha, and the same thing here for the characters with the additional constraint that if I restrict this character to the smaller field F plus minus alpha, I get the local class field theory sine character kappa alpha associated to the quadratic extension F alpha over F plus minus. These things are given by explicit formulas, which out of consideration of time, I'm not going to write down, but I'm happy to share them after the talk. They're simple explicit formulas. I would just say that this A alpha depends on the choice of an additive character of the ground field. The chi alpha does not. The formula for A alpha involves such a choice. And now I can tell you, unfortunately I'm erasing, oh no, there it is. Ah, I've planned my talk almost as well as Yanis did. Uh, so now we have the following theorem. For any element S, in SF regular, but now we have to also assume that it is shallow, which means it does not belong to the Ivahori subgroup of the torus. We have the following formula for the character, theta pi of S. There is a sign here defined by Kotwitz, a plus or minus sign. Then we have a root number, epsilon to half of a certain virtual Galo representation. So let me say what this is. Well, we have the torus S, we have its character module, which we can complexify, and the Galois group acts on it. So this is an Artin representation. And we can do the same with another torus. This is the minimal levy in the quasi-split in a form. 
a torus of the same dimension, so this virtual Galois representation is of degree zero, we take its root number. And then we take the sum over the vial group, just as before. And then inside of here, um, I'm going to write a function, which I'm going to explain in a moment. It has to do with this data A and chi that we computed down here. So this is the character formula, where this function here is the following explicit function. It's the product over all absolute roots, which are symmetric and up to the action of the Galois group of the following explicit expression. I have the chi alpha evaluated at alpha, well, I'm mixing gammas and s's again, I'm sorry about this. Let's just say that s is gamma. Um, alpha gamma minus one over A alpha, okay. Now, so this is a formula for the character. The punchline of this story is that all of this makes sense when f is the real numbers and not just when f is p-adic. And when f is the real numbers, these two become identified. This formula becomes this formula. So in other words, we have a complete analogy between the classification of regular supercuspidal representations and their character formulas for shallow elements and the classification of regular discrete series representations of real groups and their character formulas. And I would like to take this as um, a motivation as to how to construct the local Langhans correspondence, first for these regular representations, but then also to go beyond and consider non-regular representations. The represent, I do not know, I, I believe it is not determined by the character values, but it is determined by the character formula. And I've had this discussion with people who frown then and say, what the hell does that mean? But there, it's the difference between the values of a polynomial and the polynomial itself. So the, the pieces here in the formula together give you the information to precisely determine the representation. But you may not have sufficiently many shallow elements to put into the function to evaluate it, but the function knows more than its value and of the structure of this formula. No, no, if you don't have shallow elements, you can still write this formula. And somehow the A and the chi, which you computed out of the theta, they contain all, and, and somehow, how do I say? Okay, this will be an important question that will arise in about three minutes. And let me handle it there, because there the setup will be more conducive to answering the question. Because at the moment, Theta alone determines the, the representation completely. And so if I had this formula and if I could take the theta out of it, oh, well, this theta gives me the representation because the representation is parameterized by the S and the theta. I just want to raise one point. Unlike in the real case where S was determined up to GF conjugacy, in the Piatti case, this is not. So that, that there, is, there is complication. You see the complexity of the Piatti case kind of there, even though the, um, the statement of the theorem is very analogous to the real case. Um, well, there is a formula for these. A formula pins them down, but uh, the A data is, a, is unique in a, in a certain sense. You, you can define as what is called a mod A data, so it's unique up to, in a, up to a certain coset, but that's all that matters for the formula. Modular that calls it, it is unique, and it's uniquely specified. I, I can write down the formulas for you afterwards. It just takes a few minutes. Um, all right, so let's say now local lines correspondence for regular representations. Because we have a very close analogy in the classification between the real and the Piatti case, we can just look at what Langlands did to construct the correspondence for real groups and mimic that. So 
let's take a discrete parameter. Let's introduce the regularity condition for it now, namely assume the centralizer of inertia in G hat is abelian. This is going to be our regularity condition. Fix a Borel pair in the dual group, T hat, B hat, in G hat, that is gamma invariant. And then you prove that up to equivalence, the parameter is going to land in the normalizer of this torus. Okay, and but this normalizer, of course, is going to act on this torus, and so we're going to take S hat to be T hat with new Galois action given by the parameter. This is going to be dual to an algebraic torus defined over F. Just take the dual to this. This comes with a whole collection of embeddings into G. Not a, not a canonical embedding, it's not a, a subtorus of G, but it comes with a collection of embeddings. And so here is what we can now do. Choose arbitrarily chi data, chi alpha, which is objects of this type here. In the setting of the character formula, we computed them out of a theta. Now there is no theta, we choose them arbitrarily. But what this gives us is an embedding of the L group of the torus S into the L group of G exactly in such a way that the parameter we start with factors. And so we'll obtain by the local Langes correspondence for tori a character on this torus, which we then prove is regular. And now what we do is, well, we could do one of two things. We could either use this theorem, a torus and a character gives us a representation. That will not be a wise course of action because we chose arbitrarily this chi and the chi influences the theta. So that's not well defined. Instead, we're going to do something else. For each embedding that we have, we're going to write the following formula, basically the formula that I wrote there. Let Um, basically this formula. Okay, this is the formula I wrote. Let me put the lambda in here. And you look at it, and now you do the following. You demand that you take the regular supercuspid representation whose character is this. And now the question really becomes important. Does this character determine the representation? The answer is its values do not but the formula as it is does, namely the, the theta chi here together with the chi that you used to obtain it, those two things together do give you a unique representation. The cool thing that happens here is that chi occurs in two places. It was an arbitrary choice, but the choice cancels out because it shows up in two places. The lambda, was also an arbitrary choice, but it influences both the A and the root number here, so this dependence also, this dependence also cancels. So this formula depends only on the parameter and the embedding. And so it gives regular supercuspidal representation that I want to recall to denote by pi phi j. And so now we're done. Now we just define the L packet to consist of all the representations you obtain in this way for all embeddings. This is the L packet. But we also would like to have the internal structure of the packet, namely the parameterization of this packet by the centralizer of the parameter. Now, 
A very simple fact to prove here is that the centralizer of the parameter is canonically isomorphic to the Galois fixed points in, the, in this torus S hat. And so that tells you that the characters, in particular it's a billion, the character, this character group is supposed to parameterize this set by conjecturally. Well, that is the same as the character group of S hat gamma, which by Tate Nakayama duality is the first Galois cohomology of S, and the first Galois cohomology of S acts simply transitively on the embeddings of S into G. Well, more precisely of the embeddings of S into all pure inner forms of G, but let me not discuss pure inner forms. And so this gives you a simply transitive action of this group on this set. And if you want to have a bijection, you have to break this torsor by choosing, taking a Whittaker model and choosing a generic element in there. Okay, so this is the regular situation. Now I want to move beyond the regular case and discuss the singular case. So here we take just a discrete series parameter defined on the V group without any further assumptions. I'm making the assumption, remember, that P does not divide the order of the vowel group. So what can we say in this situation? Well, there is first a very, very simple observation that the situation is not regular, but it's not terribly far from being regular. Regularity meant that the centralizer of inertia is abelian by definition, right? This was our, our regularity condition here. That's false. However, the connected component is abelian. And this simple observation allows us to actually carry out all of this machine here, and we're going to get for each embedding of S, so we get a torus again, we can factor, we get a character on the torus, and so, and for each embedding, we get a supercuspidal representation, pi phi j. And the big difference now, first big difference, this pi phi of j is usually reducible. So then you say, well, okay, I won't be scared by this. I will just define the L packet as the set of irreducible constituents of this representation for every J again. So the definition of the L packet in the general case is extremely easy. It's basically as easy as in the regular case. You just break up into the irreducible constituents. Now, where do we see, there has to be some other place that counterbalances this difference. And this place is the centralizer. This is no longer true. Now, second big difference is that pi zero of S phi, the group that is supposed to parameterize the packet, is usually non-abelian. And this is where this reflects the complexity of this. And so the challenge is now the internal structure. Match the representation, irreducible representations of this non-abelian group with, with the constituents here. This is where the main problem is. Let me tell you a little bit about the structure of this centralizer now that is different. So we still have the Galois fixed points in the dual torus that embed into the centralizer, but they're not everything. There is a quotient. The quotient can be described explicitly. It's the F points of the absolute vowel group of, of this torus, the part that fixes theta. Or if you like, theta chi, but it actually does not depend on chi. Theta does, but the centralizer does not, the stabilizer in the vowel group does not. And so now you may think, okay, that's not too bad. That should be just some kind of Clifford theory. We're going to think of representations here and how they restrict here, and we're going to do something similar on, on that side. Turns out this is not at all so easy. This extension fails the multiplicity one property. 
when you take a representation and restrict it to here, it has higher multiplicity. Simple Clifford theory simply fails. And the reason for that is reflected here. The irreducible constituents of this representation also occur with higher multiplicities. And so you need to have some way of matching multiplicities on both sides, because after all, you don't just want the one-to-one -one correspondence. You'd like to later be able to prove endoscopic character identity, stability, and all of this. And so for this, you have to have a very tight relationship between these two sets. So first, there are two reductions. Reduction number one is we can still use the argument that we did here. It's not going to give us everything, but it's going to get us started. So enough to obtain a bijection between the irreducible constituents of a single such representation, pi phi j. I'm going to use brackets for irreducible constituents of these reducible representations. And the irreducible representations of S phi, or pi zero S phi, whose restriction to S hat gamma are, well, contain the character J. What does that mean? Well, J is an embedding of the torus S into G. It's a torsor under this group, which is this group. We've broken up the torso. I haven't told you exactly how, but it uses fixing a Whittaker datum. So we have a bijection between embeddings and this. And so the embedding will give me a character on S hat gamma. And so this is the character that I'm still denoting by J here. And the second reduction is we can reduce everything to depth zero. And this is part that is actually still in progress. It's, it's a very technical thing. And over the last few months, uh, this is where the progress has been in this area. But it's too technical to discuss in a talk. I would be happy to discuss in private what exactly the problem is that is involved here uh, and why, why has it been difficult. But I can tell you now how to deal with the case of depth zero, which is quite fascinating in its own Right. So uh, you'll remember depth zero representations closely related to irreducible cuspidal representations of finite groups of lead type. So we're going to quickly switch gears and go to the situation that we consider those. So let me call these geometric intertwining operators. So now G is connected reductive over finite field. S elliptic maximal torus. Theta is a character of this torus, uh, which, which is non-singular in the sense of the lean and lustig, which are exactly the characters that show up in what we're doing here. And let's take a Borel over k bar in G containing S. Then we have the usual the lean lustig variety that I'm going to, well, maybe not, not not write down the formula. This is the delin lustig variety. And the representation that we're interested in occurs in the cohomology of this variety. This is the construction of delin and lustig. So the cohomology in middle degree of this variety, well, it receives two actions on the left by the k points of G and on the right by the k points of S. So we can take the theta isotypic component and this is the representation. And our question is, this representation is reducible and this reducibility leads to the reducibility of the supercuspidal representation here that we need to study. So we now need to study the reducibility of this. And the question is parameterize irreducible constituent. And the idea to do this is the following. If you look at the paper of the Lean and Lustig, they tell you that they think of this as a generalization of parabolic induction. Now, in the classical theory, how do you decompose parabolic induction? You use self-intertwining operators to end the theory of the R group. So I thought, why don't we try to use some kind of a version of that too? Now, what are self-intertwining operators? They're composed of a few pieces, 
One is just shifting your function by the while element, but another one is changing the parabolic using the integral intertwining operator. Now, shifting by the vial group is very easy. So let's take an element in the normalizer, then write multiplication on this delin lustig variety by this element will send you to another delin lustig variety for, the different, for this different Borel. That's very simple. The question is how do you go back? What is the, what is the analog of the integral operator that changes parabolics? And this was thankfully done very recently in the work of Bonafé, Dutt, and Rukier, 2017. So they define exactly the geometric analog of the integral intertwining operator in the world of the Lin Lustig variety. It, I'll just tell you pictorially what happens they define what they call the linking variety, which is an analog of the delin lustig variety, but it depends on two Borels rather than one Borel, and a certain closed subvariety that fibers over the delin lustig variety with one Borel. And now, you, you have two such cone pictures going like this, and the theorem of Bonafé, Dat, and Rukier is that on the level of cohomology, well, let, of these individual varieties, all these maps become isomorphisms. And so even though they point in various different directions, you can actually, on the level of cohomology, go from there to there, and you can change the Borel to any other Borel. In particular, in this case that we find ourselves here, we can go back from this Borel to that Borel. And so composing this version of the integral intertwining operator with this shift, we get the self-intertwining operator, one for each element in the normalizer. So now we have a collection of self-intertwining operators, and what is very, funny in some senses, if you recall how the standard theory works, for every element in the R group you have a self intertwining operator, you have to normalize it, and one of the reasons you have to normalize it is because they don't compose properly. If you have two elements of the R group and multiply them, the two intertwining operators don't necessarily multiply to give you the intertwining operator for the product. Exactly the same issue occurs here. Langlands in the classical theory has given a conjecture of exactly how to normalize the operator so that they compose properly, and Arthur proved this in the real case, but in the Piatti case, Arthur wasn't able to prove that. He was only able to prove that there exists some normalization. Who knows what it is, but at least there exists. And that's exactly the result we have here. There exists a normalization of the self-intertwining operators. Using these self-intertwining operators, we can now break this representation into pieces. Let me write down, let me skip the statements over the finite field and come back to the Piatic field due to time constraints. Here is the theorem that we have over the Piatic field. Uh, there is a bijection between the irreducible constituents of this supercuspidal representation that we're trying to understand, the left-hand side of this reduction one, and the irreducible representations of the normalizer in the Piatic group of theta, those one whose restriction to the torus contains theta. Let me write this uh, symbolically with a the theta behind. So you take irreducible representations of this, restrict them to the uh, torus, and you take only those whose restriction contains the character theta you start with. This is a non-abelian group, and its representations can have higher dimension, and these dimensions precisely match the multiplicities of the constituents of this supercuspidal representation. So this bijection captures multiplicities exactly the way you want it. Now this on this side doesn't seem to be 
what we would like to see here. So there is one final step to get us from the right hand side there to the right hand side there. And this final step goes as follows. So we have an embedding of S into G that gives us the following extension. Right, pretty clear. And we're interested in representations of this whose restriction to S is theta. Well, we can push out by theta and we have a push out extension of C cross by this group. On the other hand, the right hand side here, if you look at it more closely, it's going to be the following. It's an extension where on this side, this is the quotient, but I'm actually going to take a subgroup, namely the group that doesn't just stabilize theta, it also stabilizes J. What was J? J was a character of this group, which corresponds with the embedding. And in the middle, I'm taking pi zero of S phi, but only the part that maps to this J. The representations for the right-hand side over there are precisely the irreducible representations of this group lying over J. So precisely the representations of this push-out extension. It's very easy to see that these two are equal. The rational vial group is precisely the absolute vowel group, the part that stabilizes this embedding J. This encodes the rational structure of the group, but we have put S into G via J. And this is the absolute structure, but we're stabilizing J. And the miracle is that, this is, these are the push out extensions. The miracle turns out that these two are the same extension. So representations of that extension, which parameterize exactly the right-hand side over there, are the same as representations of that extension, which by this result give us the reducibility here. And it all matches with the multiplicity of an irreducible constituent here, carrying over to the multiplicity of an irreducible, the dimension of an irreducible representation here, which means that when you start proving endoscopy and stability, everything lines up perfectly. So I'll, I'll stop here. I'm still working on this. It, it depends on two things. One is the exact normalization of these intertwining operators. I don't know how to normalize them precisely yet, but I think there will be something similar to Langhans' normalization where you replace L and epsilon factors by gamma factors. Um, there is another thing corresponding to the Whitaker datum, and there is, so this is still, so at the moment I can only prove that there is an isomorphism, but it's not an arbitrary isomorphism. It's, there is certain rigidity already built into the picture, but one thing that I cannot get is I get things up to a linear character of this quotient here. And this, for, for computing stability, or for computing endoscopy where the endoscopic element lives here, this disappears, this ambiguity, and you can just prove it, but if you want to take an endoscopic element living here, then you start seeing this linear character. And so at the moment, I'm not able to kill it, but I'm hopeful that with time, I'll get there. No, we're over the finite field. There are no real L functions, and but I suspect gamma factors. I think you're going to start see Gauss sums but I don't, I don't have the exact formula in mind. I'm just daydreaming about this at that point. No, no, but we're in a different situation. We're in a completely different situation. We, we're trying to... I, I agree. I agree, but we're not normalizing parabolic induction after all. We're normalizing this kind of funky geometric version of parabolic inductions. I'm guessing it will be the gamma factor that... This is just a guess. I have no, nothing but home to back up my, uh, nothing but hope to back up this guess. So I don't know. Uh, 
The Whitaker datum is relevant to this panel. Yes, it goes into identifying these two extensions together with normalization of the intertwining operators, which I believe there will be canonical choice. Ah, the, the, the genericity of representation is determined by the local character expansion around the identity and the coefficients in, the, uh, in front of the regular unipotent uh, or regular nilpotent orbital integral and whether or not this is non-zero, and you can get your hands at that uh, from the structure of the representation. So this you can determine. And you can prove that there is a unique generic person in there. You have to use a debacker spice character formula, but exactly the opposite of the piece I wrote down. I wrote the, I wrote the piece down for shallow elements. You need to exactly to go to deep elements where the formula looks completely different. There, there is a so-called Murnahan Kirillov theory there, where you see Fourier transforms of semi-simple orbital integrals. You, for certain elements that have to do with this character theta on the periodic group, you can compute exactly what what elements you get there, and then you can relate that to the character expansion, uh, the local character expansion where you have unipotent orbits. So you can tell you can you can compute the coefficients in front of the unipotent orbits based on the this character theta and the semi-simple elements in the dually algebra that it gives you. And that's how you know who is generic. It is related to the constant section because the Whitaker datum, once you fix an additive character over the, uh, over the ground field, the Whitaker datum is going to give you a pinning and the pinning is going to give you a constant section. And then the question is, you know, uh, yeah. Let me not say something that uh, <laughs> that will uh, make it more confusing. Okay. Thank you.